good morning and welcome to Northwest Church. Whether you're joining us on site or online or across any of our campuses, we're so glad that you chose to join us this weekend. We are live right now across multiple streaming and social media platforms. So if you're watching online today, make sure to share the experience, leave a comment. We'd love to connect with you or maybe you're in the building today. Make sure to share, invite one of your friends and family who may be elsewhere to join you online today. If you're new here today, thank you so much for joining the weekend experience. And we'd love nothing more than to start a conversation with you. The most simple way to do that today is to scan the QR code here on the screen and they'll take you to our digital connection card. And if you're in the room today on the seat back in front of you, you'll find a QR code there as well, or a physical connection card that you can fill out, drop in the offering bucket as they're passed around in the experience, or dropping off at one of the giving centers as you leave today. And make sure to stop by the New Here Center because we'd love to meet you, have a conversation with you following the experience. If you want more information about Northwest Church and stay up to date with all upcoming events and things that are happening here at Northwest, check out Northwest Church. Dot TV. Also, follow us on social media so you can stay up to date. Also, if you want to stay connected with Northwest Church throughout the week, make sure to subscribe to our Northwest Church YouTube channel. You can access that by scanning the QR code here on the screen. Or today, maybe you want to catch up on some past messages, or maybe you just need some encouragement during the week. Make sure to check out our Northwest Church podcast, and you can access that on any of your favorite streaming platforms. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to an awesome day here at Northwest Church. Let's get ready to worship. worship our risen king today. Come on, wherever you're watching online, come on, let's give a shout together to Jesus.
Come on, today get thankful that we serve a risen king. Come on, would you give him praise? Man, it's so good to be in church today in the presence of God. But I believe today we walk in with a confidence and a joy because the tomb is empty. He's not there anymore. He's defeated death, hell, and the grave, and he's alive, ruling and reigning forevermore. So today, as we worship, let confidence arise and let joy fill your heart because the king is risen. Let's worship him today. There's something that occurred on that evening at Calvary that created such a lavish stir in all of history. Upon that old rugged cross, our Savior bared it all and offered himself a sacrifice to atone for humanity's fall. The sacred blood that was spilled wiped clean the sinner's slate Christ paid the price for everyone and carried our weight. A willing heart endured the pain and purpose paved his way. He opened the eyes of every man to whom he came to save. Though the tragedy of that day will be mourned by those around, our joy is found three days later when he arose from the ground. And through that selfless act of love, we were given new life in him, set loose from our bondages to experience true freedom within. The cross is still freeing, his stripes are still healing, his blood is still redeeming, and his love is still reaching. All praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever. Your cross is my freedom, your stripes is my healing. All praise, King Jesus, and glory to God in heaven. Your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching all oh, praise king jesus come on sing that out today see your cross because your cross is my freedom your stripes is my healing all oh, praise king jesus glory to god in heaven your blood is still speaking your love is still reaching all praise, King Jesus, and glory to God forever. Yeah. Glory to God forever. Oh, hail the King, and glory to God forever. Come on, can we lift our hands all throughout the room as we sing glory?
Jesus, and glory to God forever. All praise, King Jesus. All praise, King Jesus. All praise, King Jesus. Come on, sing it to him today. Glory to God forever. All praise, King Jesus. All praise.
worship to him. your hands all across this room every room that's joined us online today would you tell him how great he is come on would you begin to tell him Lord you are good you are great father we declare today Lord that you are great that there is no one like you that no one compares to you today you are great not just because you do great things in our lives you are great because it's who you are. It's your nature. So today we declare that you are great. Thank you, Lord, for your protection, your provision. Thank you, Lord, for intervening in our lives, walking with us. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't just leave us on this earth and say good luck. But Lord, that you're with us. You are great. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, wow. I want you to remain standing just for a moment. I know this is our sixth experience in the last three days. It's been absolutely incredible. And the thing that stands out the most is just God's presence has been here starting Friday night. It's just been absolutely incredible. Thank all of you for being here today. Now, I don't want this to be awkward. It, it may be awkward if you don't know the person standing next to you. But I want you to turn to the person standing next to you and give them a big hug. Would you do that? <laughs> you may be seated. Once again, thank you for being here today, all of you, in person, on site, all of you who have joined us online today. Thank you so very much for being a part of the Easter experience at Northwest. I just want to take a moment and say thank you to our staff and all the people who make this happen, not just on Easter, but every weekend. It's very humbling to be a part of what God's doing here at Northwest Church. So thank all of you for being here today and all of you who give and all of you who serve and make this experience happen. So thank you so very, very much. If you are new to Northwest, we want to welcome you. We would love to start a conversation with you. Here's what that looks like. There's a QR code located on a chair in front of you. There's another QR code located on the screen up front. If you would scan that QR code, again, if you're new, if you'll scan that QR code, it will lead you to a simple and a short form. And by filling out a simple and a short form, you'll allow us to start a conversation with you. So thank you for doing that. Everyone else in the room, if you would, would you take out your phones? And we call this sharing our faith. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to check in at Northwest Church. So make, you, make sure you check in at Northwest Church. And then I want you to say something positive about your experience. Now, if you can't say anything positive about your experience, just check in. How about that? So we want you to know it's, it's a sharing our faith. And because countless number of people attend this church because they see other people checking in every week and talking about their experience. So this is a great opportunity for you to share your faith. So thank you for doing that. All right, at this time, we're going to bring our tithe and our offering to the Lord. Come on, can we get a... That sounds like a little courtesy clap today. Come on, can we really get excited about bringing our tithe and offering to the Lord? And, uh, you know, as I just hold... Boy, you guys are ready to go, aren't you? Yes, sir. All right. Well, as I say often, you know, uh, we're not weird, but we are a little wired today. So we get excited. And I want to say this. You are a giving 
And you are a serving and you are a generous church. And because of your giving, because of your serving, and because of your generosity, we're making a difference in people's lives, not only in Northwest Arkansas, but around the world today. So let me just say thank you for being obedient today. May God bless you. There are multiple ways in which you can bring your tithe today. One, fill out an envelope, drop it off in one of these buckets. Or if you're online or in the room, turn your attention to our screens. There are multiple ways in which you can bring your tithe in offering. And as I say often, regardless of the avenue that you choose to bring your tithe in offering, thank you for being obedient and thank you for being faithful. And doesn't it make you feel good that when you give, you know that you're making a difference in people's lives in Northwest Arkansas and around the world? Well, as always, we've got a lot of exciting things that are going on in Northwest Church. So if you would, turn your attention to our screen. Welcome to Northwest Church. The experience is off to a great start, and we have some fun, exciting events upcoming that we want you to know about, so check these out. The I Have Decided Baptism event is happening next Sunday, April 7th, and we want you to be a part of it. If you've recently decided to follow Christ or rededicated your life, or maybe you've never been water baptized, this is the event for you. Register today at northwestchurch.tv. This summer, we will be heading to Paragold, Arkansas to renovate our new campus. If you would like to join us, there will be an interest meeting following the 1130 experience on April 14th. We'd love for you to join us. Attention Northwest men, we would love to invite you to join us on April 20th at 9 a.m. for our men's breakfast. This is a great opportunity to connect with other guys at Northwest Church and enjoy a great breakfast. We hope to see you there. Hey ladies, we'd love to invite you to our Beach Bunko Night happening April 24th at 6.30 p.m. This is a great opportunity to connect with other women at Northwest Church and have an evening of fun, games, and entertainment. We have so many ways for you to get connected here at Northwest Church and we hope you and your family have a great Easter. Well, good morning once again. A lot of great things going on in Northwest Church. And the ladies always get excited about Bunko. And, uh, you know, Bunko's a, a game where you roll dice. And I, I grew up where you couldn't roll dice. You know, you're, you go to hell for, for playing <laughs> games like that. And uh, us men, we're, we're not going to be playing uh, di with dice. We're going to eat. And that's a very spiritual thing. It's throughout the Bible. So, uh, in that great? <laughs> That's right. We're way more spiritual than the ladies. We already, we already knew that, though, but we won't make a big deal out of that. Hey, I want, you to take, <laughs> I want you to take your Bibles, and let's go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, as we conclude, so what we're going to do today, we're going to put a book in on our series, John's Eyewitness Account of the Life and Ministry of Jesus. Now, up to this point, we have looked at three different miracles, and today we're going to look at the greatest miracle of all, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Bertrand Russell, here's what he said. He was a well-known atheist philosopher who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950, and in his book, Why I Am Not a Christian, he argued all organized religions were mere hypocritical, superstitious, and have no basis in reality. And on one occasion, Russell was asked what he would say to God if he found himself standing before him. I think it's a little odd that he doesn't believe in God, but yet he answers a question about if he ever had the opportunity to stand before God, what would he ask him? And here's what he asked. He said, sir, why did you not give me better evidence? Christ followers and non-Christ followers today are still asking the same question. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, well, I would believe in God if. I would believe in God if he wrote his name in the clouds. I would believe in God if he spoke to me in an audible voice. Or I would believe in God if he would appear to me in person. Well, let me stop and let you know that 
first of all, wouldn't that be great if God revealed himself that way? That think about every time you spoke to God in prayer, he would audibly answer you back. Would that not be incredible? Well, even better, what if you asked God something and he just appeared in a bodily form? Wouldn't that be incredible? That, that would probably scare some of us to death. But that would be great. But what I want you to know, that is not how God chose to reveal himself. Rather, he chose to reveal himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, here's what we do know. No one can deny that 2,000 years ago, a prophet, a teacher named Jesus, walked the hills of Galilee and was crucified. The whole Bible points to Jesus as the Savior of the world. The underlying theme of the Bible is Jesus and the one central moment in his life, the cross and the resurrection. It was at the cross that Satan was defeated. Our condemnation was lifted. Our death sentence was revoked. Our salvation was made secure. And the door of heaven was opened wide for all of those who accepted Christ could enter. The empty tomb is at the core of the evidence that Jesus indeed rose from the dead. And the empty tomb is what separates Christ and Christianity from all other religions. If that is the case, then all of us us have to decide how are we going to respond to the empty tomb. Because we cannot just say that Jesus was a good teacher or he was a good example Because he either is Lord of all or nothing at all. He is either Lord of all or nothing at all. The great writer C.S. Lewis said, He is either a lunatic, a liar, or he is Lord. So this Easter, let's look at John's account of the empty tomb. And what I really want to focus on are the three different people who all had a different response to the empty tomb. So here's the big takeaway. Here's the big idea, just in case you go to sleep in the next 20 minutes on me. is the big idea is the tomb is empty. We cannot deny that. So the real question is, how are you going to respond to the empty tomb? Because the empty tomb demands a response. A non-response is still a response but it demands a response. So according to John, the empty tomb was discovered by three people. Mary Magdalene, and then there was Simon Peter, and of course, there was John. So let's look at this in John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Now once you find John 20, you stay there because we're going to park there throughout the day. Are you guys ready for this? Listen. I've got to empty all of this or I'm going to embarrass Christy today when we go to Walmart and buy groceries. I'll be preaching this stuff in the aisle, so i got to get it all out right here. Are you all ready for this? Yeah. So here's what the Word says. Early on Sunday morning while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, let's put this in context. We must remember that Jesus had predicted that all of this was going to happen. He predicted that that Judas would betray him four days earlier, and that Simon Peter would deny him three times. All of this would be fresh in their minds when they got to the empty tomb, when they got to the tomb and realized that the body of Christ was no longer there. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a deep dive, and we're going to look at the different responses to the empty tomb. Number one, it's in your notes. There was a response of apathy. So John chapter 20, begin reading in verse 3. Here's what the word says. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple, that being John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Verse 6, then Simon Peter arrived and Simon went inside. Now that should not surprise us because Simon Peter was one of those guys that reminds me of Pastor Joe sometimes in which I act and then think. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? You speak and then you think. Well, Simon Peter was one of those kind of guys. So when he got there, he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. Now, I want to stop here just for a moment because this is really important. The Greek language here means that the clothes that they saw were lying still in their folds. That's important. Lying still in their folds. Now, what that means when they discovered the clothes that Jesus left behind when he rose from the dead, they were not laying like in a heap, kind of like your teenagers do when they take their clothes off. They just throw them in a pile and they magically get washed and laundried and hung back up in their closets. But that's not what this is referring to. But rather, they were still, watch this, lying there in the regular folds as if the body of Christ had simply evaporated out of them. Now visualize that for a moment. The clothes are there, but they're still in a bodily form. Verse 7 says, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Now remember, no one was in that tomb except Jesus himself. Now you read that and say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, the whole head cloth thing was a signal to the followers of Christ. Here's what it really means. When you look at the Jewish and Hebrew custom of the day, whenever a servant would take his master his food the master would be sitting there and he was eating and like you and I do so often when he was finished he would simply get up and take his napkin and kind of wad it up and kind of toss it on his plate and then he would get up and leave and when he would do that that would be a sign or a signal to the servant who was standing a little ways off hey I'm finished I'm not coming back so you can come and get my food and take it away but sometimes the master would get up and when he would fold his napkin, that was a signal, not wadded up, but he would fold it. That was a signal to the servant who was standing by watching, I'm not finished with my meal. I'm going to come back a little bit later. So when Jesus rose out of those grave clothes, he intentionally folded that head cloth because he wanted his disciples and followers to know that I'm not finished with this. This thing is not over and one day I'm going to come back. That is the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise of the return of Jesus Christ. Now that's free. Well, let's move on. Verse 8 says, then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. Let me give you something. This is also free. This is the second time that John wants everybody to know that he outran Peter and Mary to the tomb. That he got there first. So watch this. When he saw he be and, and believed, verse 9 says, for until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said that Jesus must rise from the dead. Verse 10 says that they simply went home. So they saw the empty tomb and they believed, but they went back to living their normal life. Simon Peter, according to John chapter 21, went back to fishing because that was his job before Christ had called him. Now, this is an interesting response because they had just discovered the whole essence of what Jesus had been teaching them. Yet verse 10 simply says, they went home. Now before you think and before you judge, how could they possibly respond with such apathy? How often do you and me, how often do we respond the same way? Meaning we have the cure for our culture today. We have discovered the empty tomb ourselves, yet we go back home and we get involved with our busy lives. We throw ourselves in our work, and then we come back Sunday after Sunday, and we discover the empty tomb again, 
only to go back to work on Monday, go back to our normal lives, only to come back the next Sunday to discover the empty tomb, only to return on Monday, and we just keep repeating the cycle over and over and over again. But if we truly believe we cannot simply go home and return to our normal lives because the empty tomb, it demands an active response. Amen. In a world in which the wheels of truth and morality have gone off the tracks, we can no longer sit back with an attitude of apathy. We must be encouraged and motivated by the empty tomb. I mean, you know, when you think about it, if you go out and you eat at a nice restaurant and maybe it's the first time you ate there, it could be a fast food or very expensive, it doesn't matter. If you go somewhere new and you eat there, well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take a picture of your food and put it on social media. That's the first thing you're going to do. And then you're probably going to take a selfie of you eating that food. But then at the bottom of that tag, you're going to say something about, hey, guys, you got to come check this place out because it's really good. So if you ate at a good place, my point is, you're not going to keep it to yourself. Well, let's say if you were at the mall this afternoon and you saw a child, a small child crying, and it's obvious they're lost and their parents are not there, you wouldn't just simply walk by and not try to help the situation. Let's take it a step further. Well, what happened if you had the cure for your cancer? Would you just go home and say, well, hey, I got the cure for cancer and share it with no one? No. Well, as Christ followers, we cannot just sit on the sidelines with a spirit of apathy as our world screams for help and answers. You know why? Because the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives on the inside of us that empowers us to live a Christ-like life and to have the boldness and the courage to share this Jesus with other people. So we can't just have a spirit of apathy. Well, like, yes. You know, I bought a new outfit, I'm at church today, and I'm going to eat with my family, and it's just going to be another day. My prayer this week is this will not be not just another day, not just another sermon, not just another set of three songs, but today that God will challenge and he will change you and that you will leave here knowing that you got to do something about what's going on in our world. And what I mean by that is that not to join a picket line. That's not about a political party. It's about you living a Christ-like life. Meaning when you go home, when you go into your workspace, that there's enough Jesus living on the inside of you that people who don't know him are going to recognize that there's something different about who you are. So we can't just have a spirit of apathy like, oh, well, the tomb is empty. Let's sing. Let's go home. No, we cannot do that. Number two, there's a response of hopelessness. John chapter 20, verse 11 says, Mary was standing outside the tomb and she was crying. And as she wept, she stooped and she looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. And verse 13 says, Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. Mary heard all the same predictions. She knew that Jesus predicted his death, but she believed the rumor that his body had been taken. So she responds, watch this, with a sense of hopelessness. In fact, her grief was so, is so profound that when the two angels appear to her, it does not register at all. She's not able to connect the dots because she's overcome with such grief. Now, keep in mind that Mary was delivered of seven demons by Jesus. So she was extremely devoted to him. She was, uh, after all, rescued and restored by Christ. And when Mary arrives, it seems as if all of her hope, her purpose for living is now drained literally out of her body. Well, Mary may represent many of you this morning. At one time, you had an experience, and maybe you even had a relationship with Christ, meaning he rescued and he restored you. He gave you hope, and he gave you a reason for living. But now, as you sit here, you wonder if he is still there. 
I mean, there's something inside of you that wants to believe again. If not, you would not be here. But it feels like that experience with Christ is long gone and it's long ago. You no longer feel what you once did and you no longer have the hope of regaining what was lost. The writer Julian Barnes once confessed, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Journalist Hunter Thompson said, all my life I have sought something that I cannot name. So for you, the empty tomb does not mean hope. It does not bring hope. Rather, it symbolizes your search for a God who does not seem to be there. Maybe you have lost hope today because maybe God did not come through in a way that you thought he could. Maybe you're disappointed in this God that I'm preaching about. Maybe you didn't have the outcome. Maybe you are in a season or an intersection of your life that you never dreamed that you would ever be at this point. And you're disappointed in God. Maybe you're disappointed in pastors. Maybe you're disappointed in a church. Maybe you're disappointed in other Christ followers. And you have lost hope somewhere in your journey. But I want you to know, dare to hope again. Put your hope not in a preacher, not in Pastor Joe. Don't put your hope in a church, including Northwest Church. But you will, watch this, you will not find hope in a relationship. You will not find hope in drugs. You will not find hope hope in a bottle. I want you to know your only hope will be found in Jesus Christ because he is the hope of our life. He is the hope of our world today. And that's the reason that I preach today. Why? Because I have a sense of hope that Jesus has the power to change who you are and what you do. So wherever you are today in your marriage, wherever your children may be today, don't you dare give up the hope on those kids. Don't you give up hope on that marriage. Don't you give up hope on that miracle that you need for your body. You know why? Because my hope is not with the doctor. My hope is not in my kids. But my hope is in Jesus Christ. He is the source of all of my hope today. So dare to hope again. Have the audacity today to hope and put that hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. Finally, we see number three, a response of doubt. Look at John chapter 20, verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and I put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound of his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. So Jesus was in a sealed tomb, and he came out. The doors was locked, and he walked in. And he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. I want you to look at my hands I want you to put your hand into the wound of my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And in verse 28, Thomas responded with, My Lord, my God. He makes this response very personal. So he went from doubting Thomas to believing Thomas. Amen. Now I'm going to get real for a moment. You guys, can we get real? Yeah. Oh, y'all aren't getting this. You know what we do as church people every week, not just Easter. We get all dressed up. We're a hot mess before we get here. I mean, we're grabbing, we're snatching kids, we're barking at each other, and we're driving in traffic and we're doing all this, honking the horns and all those kind of things. That's why we don't have bumper stickers that say, I love Northwest Church. <laughs> but we do all of that. I mean, we're a hot mess, and we're just frantically getting here, and flying through traffic. We walk in the door and see the greeters, and they're like, how are you? And you're like, <laughs> it's like magic has happened. The hot mess is gone. I'm all new. I'm resurrected. I've got my Christian face on. I've got my Christian clap on. i got it all going on right here. Well, I just want to get real for a moment. Are y'all ready for this? I have been 
a Thomas before and after surrendering my life to Christ. And I want you to know that doubt is not a sin and it is common in our lives as Christ followers. I've had moments of doubting not only the sovereignty, but the existence of God. Parents, let me help you out when your kids come and say, I doubt God. I don't believe in God. Maybe they're searching for God. Let them search. Because when they search, they will find God. I said when they search and they look for him, they will find him. I have doubted and asked, are you there? Are you who you say you are? I have, I have laid in bed and said, Lord, am this gospel that I'm preaching, is it fake? Is it not real? Are you really who you say you are? Can you really do what you say that you can do? There have been times that I have prayed in which there was no faith. Now, maybe you're not like me. Maybe you wake up every day and your faith is like on level high and everything is great and you just feel like that everything you're going to pray and never doubt well you're better than I am because I just pray sometimes and I doubt that it's ever going to happen I doubted that some of you would be here today and you're here I, I just I have doubts sometimes and I struggle with that but just like Thomas I've responded to the empty tomb with doubt and this Easter maybe you can relate to Thomas Maybe you came today just to appease a friend or a family member and you've got it together and you're here. And maybe you're still looking and maybe you're still seeking for what you once had in Christ. But you doubt that you will ever have that again. Are you still skeptical? Are you, are you like Mr. Russell who would like to have a little bit more evidence? Are you like Thomas and maybe you just want to touch and feel for yourself? That's been my prayer this week, that you would feel and see the presence of who Jesus Christ is. And maybe some of you, it was long ago and maybe it was a long time ago, but you're still here. There's got to be a little bit of faith or you would not be here today. But you say, Pastor, I just doubt that I can feel what I once had with Christ, that I can get back where I once was. Maybe you think that God's disappointed because you're doubting today. Well, I want you to know that he understands and he can relate to your doubt. Note what he does not say to Thomas. He does not say, Thomas, come on, man. He does not say, Thomas, above everybody, you should know because you saw the miracles for yourself. You and I hung out together. We went to Sonic together, Thomas. We went to the men's breakfast together. Yes, we were there together. You saw the miracles. You heard me teach you that I was going to die. They were going to put me in the tomb. I would be there three days, but I would rise again. He didn't say any of that to Thomas. What did he say? He said, Put your fingers right here into my hands. He said, put your hand into my side. Look into my soul. I am Jesus. I am the resurrected one. I am the one who died and rose again. I'm telling you, he can handle your doubts. If you think you're going to wig God out over your doubts and you've got another thing. No. The empty tomb demands a response. Because the tomb is empty. I said the tomb is empty. Jesus understands he can relate to that doubt. There's plenty of evidence. There's an entire library of 66 books assembled in different countries. Written by different authors, authors over a span of 2,000 years that all testify to Jesus Christ. History and millions of people through two millennia speak of Jesus. All of those who discover the empty tomb, by the way, they preach the resurrection under threats of death, imprisonment, torture, and even execution. Yet, not one of them ever recanted, including Thomas. He later would go to India to preach the gospel where he would be thrown into prison and eventually executed for his faith 
in Jesus who died and rose from the dead. Obviously, he was no longer faithless. Now, I want you to think about this. Forget the empty tomb. Forget all of the books. Forget all of the history. Forget all of the evidence that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Only take his followers, his disciples. Every one of them, I think, watch this. They gave up their life and was executed for their belief that Jesus was who he said he was. Now, I want you to listen to this. Who? Who would die for something in which they did not believe? Who would give up their life? Who would stand on a platform and preach the gospel if it were not true? Knowing that when they were finished preaching, there was a good chance they were going to lose their life. Who would do that? Yet none of them ever recanted. The tomb is empty. Jesus and his followers are either lunatics, liars, or he is Lord. I stand on this platform today with all the authority of God's word. And I declare that Jesus was not a lunatic. He was not a liar. But he is the Lord. And he is the risen Lord today. He has resurrection power to change your life forever and ever. The empty tomb demands a response. Will you respond with apathy or action, I want you to hear my heart today. Will you return to Christ? It is so easy in this world to get off track. It is so easy in our world to get discouraged, even get depressed, to lose hope and lose faith, and to just get off of the right path. But the invitation today is, will you return to Christ? Will you dare to have hope in his resurrection power again? Return to Christ because we cannot lose hope because our hope is found in Jesus. What is really messed up in our world today is people are looking for hope in everything and everyone except Jesus. People are thinking if I find the right guy or the right girl, that will bring total fulfillment to my life. You can marry Superman or Wonder Woman and your hope still will not be fulfilled without Jesus Christ. You can have the best job. You can have all of the money. But without Jesus, your life will be empty. I'm telling you today, put your hope in Jesus. The empty tomb demands a response. What will be your response to the empty tomb? Now, let me help you with this. I'm about done. You're going to have doubts. You won't hear a lot of preachers say that, but you are going to have doubts. If you don't doubt this Christ, I doubt that you're really following him. You're going to doubt. There are going to be moments that you're going to doubt his sovereignty, his will, his purpose. And you may even doubt his existence. Meaning, are you even there, Lord? But we must be more determined to be strong and to finish strong. You know what, we're, what unites all of us? It's not our gender. It's not our race. It's not our bank accounts. You, you know what unites all of us? Christ. Christ is what unites all of us in this room. I want you to hear my heart today. I've preached for almost 15 years from this platform. The persecution is coming to America and to this world like we've never seen. It's at our doorstep. It's here. It's no longer coming. It's already here. I don't say that to scare you. I tell you that to tell you that you're going to have to get off the fence with your faith. You're either going to believe that he is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do or you're not going to believe it. But what I'm saying is it's going to come to a point and you're going to come to an intersection in your life life, where it will force you to get off the fence. You're either going to believe or you're not going to believe. Hear my heart. Feel my passion today. 
Put your hope and your faith in Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is God and who does not change. Everything in this world will continue to change. He is the one thing that will not change. You put your hope and your faith in him, in him. He will not disappoint you. Now, the outcome sometimes that you ask and expect will disappoint you, but he will never disappoint you. So today, the empty tomb demands a response. What will be your response? Would you bow with me this morning? I'll give you an opportunity, like I do every week, to respond to the salvation message. Beginning with you who are online today, thank you for joining us. Would you hit the share button? Would you share this word today? By chance you're watching and you say, Pastor, I want to commit or recommit my life to Jesus Christ. You're tired of doing it on your own. I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you're watching online today, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me of my arrogance, ignorance, trying to do life without you? Would you forgive me of all the wrong and all the sin? Would you forgive me today? Would you come and live in my heart and be the Lord of my life? If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. Call a friend, have them pray with you. Go to the inbox, send us a note. We'd love to be a part of your journey. You that are in the room this morning, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to isolate you, but I do want to pray with you today. Multiple people have been either rededicated, recommitted, or committed their life to Christ this weekend. I'm asking you, are you tired of doing life without Christ? Are you running out of power? Are you running out of answers? Are you tired of being frustrated? Are you tired of being, well, I just, I'm doing my best, but it still, it just does not measure up. Well, if that's you, you are at a great point that you can just turn all this over to Christ. He is the answer that you're searching for, even if you don't realize it. So the question this morning is, do you want to commit or recommit your life to Jesus Christ? If so, all I want you to do is lift your hand. I want to pray with you. That hand is going up. It's awesome. Come on, more hands are going up. More hands are going up. Hands are going up everywhere. Come on, guys. We got to be ready. Oh, yes. Hands are going up. We got a young lady back here. You hold your hands up and keep them up. Somebody's going to find you. Hold your hands up. Hold your hand up. There's a young man right here. Right here. Just hold your hand up. Somebody's going to find you. Christy, would you come pray with this person over here? Just keep your heads bowed. There's a lot of people. We're, we're going to make time. We're going to make room. Come on, if you have somebody's not come to you, I want you to raise your hand. There's a young man right here. Young man right here. Anyone else? Wow. Make sure they fill out a commitment card today. Make sure they fill out a commitment card. If you're praying with somebody today, make sure you get information in their commitment today. Wow, God's presence is so real this morning. I want everyone else to stand at your feet this morning and as loud as you can, I want you to give it up this morning that people are committing. Recommitting their lives to Jesus this morning through the action this morning. Jesus, Jesus. I want, we got a lot of people praying with people this morning. I need a prayer team this morning to come. I, it's going to take a whole new group of people. So I need a prayer team to come. Stephen, would you come? Come on, I need some more people to come. Sam, would you come? I need some more people to come. I want you guys to come this morning.
you're praying with somebody, please stay there. Please stay there if you're praying with somebody. I know it's Easter. I know everybody's dressed up, and I know everybody's about to spend some time with friends and family. But I believe in the altar, and I believe that the empty tomb demands a response. Every week when I preach this word, it demands a response because it's God's word. Sometimes your non-response is still a response, but it demands a response. So if you're here this morning, so Pastor, I want somebody to pray with me or for me. If that's you, I want you to step out where you are as we begin to sing right away. And as we begin to sing, if you want somebody to pray with you or for you, I want you to come and stand in front of one of these people. They're going to pray for you right now. Come on, I want you to come. The power of God is here. Turn the lights on, please. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, Lord. Come on, when you get here, somebody's going to come and pray with you. Be looking. Be paying attention.
that again. If you believe the tomb is still empty this morning, can we give him our best shout of praise? Well, on behalf of everyone here at Northwest Church, we want to wish you and your family a happy Easter. Thank you so much for choosing to be with us this weekend. Before we head out, don't forget about our water baptisms happening next Sunday, immediately following the 1130 experience. We love you guys. Have an incredible week, and we will see you next Sunday.